I actually prepared this, this talk um, before Christmas for the Friends of Barara Valley. And that was their, that is their little logo there. And in fact, I'm holding up a badge. I'm not sure if you can see, but they have the glossy black cockatoo as their, um, their symbol from the Friends of Barara Valley because it is where they are found, one of the places in Sydney. And I say, I do get them at my place at Buckety as well. Um, there was today, in fact, the, why have I got the Guardian? Um, before Christmas, they had the people voting for Australia's favourite favourite bird. They had a bit of a fun competition. And today, actually, the Guardian was, had an article about how many people are watching birds um, stuck at home um, or going out for walks, doing bird surveys, and particularly after the fires, that citizen science, recording where the birds have been seen, not just glossies, but all sorts of um, birds and lyrebirds in particular is another species that have been very affected by the birds. So what you guys, what we can see and record, recorded on bird data, is really helping with the science, our citizen science, finding out how birds have been affected. Oh, come on, next slide. The, um, these are the favourite birds from the Guardian last year. And I've chosen them because the, the rainbow lorikeets and sulphur crested cockatoos were way up there, some of the parrots. There was a bit of lobbying, heavy lobbying going on, I think, with this voting because the good old ibis was way up there and also the black-throated grass finch. There was a distinct lobbying for that. So that was a little species that was being going to be affected by the Adani mines. So that's why that was featuring. So parrots, glossy black cockatoos belong to the parrots. There's two families of parrots, the parrots and lorries and the cockatoos. So a lot of those species you'd know, they're little red rump parrots here, the corellas, the, the, um, the red tailed black cockatoos, the rainbow lorikeet, sulphur crested and king parrot. So looking at the cockatoos, 21 species of cockatoos. Most are large and stocky. And they've all got that erectile crest. Well, I'm pointing with my finger, that's no help. Um, erectile crest, large, robust bills and a muscular tongue, which is surprising for processing the seeds that they eat. And their skulls are reinforced around their eyes because they have to have strong muscles because when they're eating their seed, their bill has a sideways movement. So they have to be, have strong muscles to allow that, that bill movement for eating their food. Feathers are mostly black, white, or gray and pink. And they have well-developed powder down. A fact, in, cockatoo, in captivity, cockatoos would have a lifespan similar to humans. So when you need some interesting dinner conversation, you can come up with these facts. And the cockatoo word, the word cockatoo, I should say, has its origins in Malay, and it means vice or grip because of their incredibly strong beak. If you've been bitten one, you'll know why I say that. And the Australia's commonest and wide, most widespread cockatoo is the galah. Also cockatiels. Other species like the gangang, who's the male, these wonderful um, pink punk hairdo um, are declining, in trouble. So all of the cockatoos have this strong, robust bill and that muscular tongue, you can see it here. So it's just feeding some chickweed or some such. These are uh, uh, red tail blacks I, I photographed up in Darwin where my daughter lives. So see those big strong bills and that muscular tongue. I'm not quite sure what they're eating these seeds, something on the Darwin foreshore I saw, they were crunching away on those big seeds there. I think they've got quite strong big seeds inside, whatever that is. Okay, now, handedness, why I've got that. Most cockatoos are left-handed, whereas most people are right-handed. In about 16 species of Australian parrots, some scientists at Macquarie Uni found that not all species, though, are the same. Some parrots, such as the sulphur-crested cockatoo, are 
entirely left-handed, left-footed. And others, including the king parrot, are mainly right-handed. A sulphur-crested cockatoo, as you can see there, uses his left claw to hold his food. Um, while the findings establish that some parrot species are left-handed and some are right-handed, others, such as budgerigars, galahs and rainbow lor lorikeets, are ambidextrous. Why? Who knows? So, having a look at the study, they said every single individual of sulphur-crested cockatoo we've seen was left-handed. When you see the juveniles that have just fledged, some are used them with both hands. Perhaps they're just learning how to do it. So, sulphur-crested cockatoo, cockatoos are, in fact, left-handed. Um, now, they looked at some glossy black cockatoos on Australia's Kangaroo Island. I'll come back to about Kangaroo Island. You've probably heard of that in the fires and the dreadful way the, the glossies were affected there. So they're often perching in the casuarina trees where they spend most of their waking hours feeding on the small seed cones. I'll show you some more pictures later. But they always hold the seed cone with their left foot and standing on their right foot and ripping the cone apart with their bill. I, I, I can just imagine doing this next part. They said their research, research team observed 27 cockatoos devour 1,382 seed cones over several months. Imagine counting them. Um, and only once did the bird handle a cone with its right foot. And that was a young bird and they just thought he was, they just decided he was a bit goofy and just learning still how to do it. So again, this is a red-tailed black cockatoo. Same, using his left foot. Okay, now all parrots um, depend on tree hollows of some kind for nesting. These pictures, these are some red rump parrots in a spout at Sydney Olympic Park and a rainbow lorikeet coming out of a nest hollow. Rainbow lorikeets, beautiful birds, but in fact compete for a lot of tree hollows. Uh, they wouldn't compete with the glossies in tree hollows, but they certainly, I've seen them in the forest at Sydney Olympic Park, out competing musk lorikeets. Just sit on top of them, just nest on top of even if there's younger eggs still in the nest. So the fact that they depend so much on tree hollows, a particular set of challenges when you're thinking of their conservation. Um, so if they're just sitting on eggs in a hollow in a tree, it's quite a secure environment. But if there's a predator, be it a, um, a, another big raptor of some kind, a possum or a goanna, once they're in the hollow, they've got little chance of escape. So predation in nest hollows or loss of nest hollows is a big problem with, with these endangered parrots. It can be as simple as putting possum guards around the bottom of trees. I've got some pictures later. Or controlling predators around nest sites. And competition is a crucial factor. As I said, the rainbow lorikeets do outcompete. At Sydney Olympic Park, um, the ranges we have been doing surveys on the red rumps. There's a nice little population of red rumps there. We were concerned that rainbow lorikeets were out competing them for nest hollows and also some of the introduced birds like um, common miners, but that's not a problem there, but the rainbow lorikeets can be. So sulphur-crested cockatoos, um, rely on nest hollows. That's actually a cockatoo in, um, uh, not Five Dock School, Abbotsford School in the school ground. So it was nesting in a tree hollow there. Not only possums, uh, not only um, cockies, that's a little ringtail possum that had a, a, um, a nest, a dray in a hollow at Sydney Olympic Park. So again, it's probably not their main predator, but brush tail possums in particular are a big problem. So looking at some of the cockatoos, white cockatoos. I stayed with a friend in Central Concord last night. Down the middle of Majors Bay Road is a lovely row of gum trees. And each night there's great raucous mob of cockatoos come in, uh, not cockatoos, corellas I mean, come and roost there. Um, droppings all over the place, a lot of noise. Um, same with white cockatoos in places. So these are, even though they're open country cockatoos, these cockatoos, I'm feeding on the ground and grasses and plants, but 
they can take advantage of changes in our environment. Some of these are the winning species that um, can monopolise the forest and the feeding sites and the nest hollows against species like our glossies. They're in large flocks, they can be agricultural pests, and their chewing habit and noise can make them quite a nuisance. So down in central Concord, yep, I'm sure they go over to Concord Golf Club, but on the corellas I imagine are a bit of a problem um, chewing in the grass and eating nut grass and so on there in the in the golf course. Then there's the black cockatoos. They're less less obvious, less readily seen, I should say. Um, in family groups or small flocks, they have a most of the black cockatoos have a much more specialised diet, with those bills specially modified to help them get food and process their food. They're much slower to to adapt to exotic food. I think of species like rainbow lorikeets and noisy miners, they're not parrots of course, um, and the sulphur crested's almost like weeds. They seem to be able to take advantage of wherever they go and outcompete other species. They need large hollows for nesting, all the black cockatoos, which is a critical management issue. Um, so moving on. So yellow black cockatoo is the one you're most likely to see in Sydney. Hope they're cool words. Yellow trails, black cockatoo. Very common call, commonly heard, particularly when there's a great mob of them, a great flock. And a friend of mine who lives at um, Cow Ann said she had about a hundred roosting in trees in her street the other day. You can imagine the noise there. We have red-tailed black cockatoos now, um, which we won't get around here, as I said. No, now it's not going to progress. No, they're the white-tailed blacks. You see that now? Yep, carnabies and bowdowns. They're the white, uh, the Western Australian white ones. Um, now I'll just find my notes again. Sorry. I put my notes down when I was panicking. Here we go. Um, this was just in the news just the other day. So when they did the um, the carnabies, the big cocky count of the the white-tailed carnaby cockatoos in Western Australia, um, they found out that some 20, 70 percent of all the carnabies recorded recorded in the Perth Peel region um, were very dependent on Nangara plantation areas um, with exotic pines and that's where the, they were they got rid of a whole lot of those pines which were vital roost and feed trees. So the plantation had shrunk from 23,000 to 5,000 hectares over the last 10 years so a lot of the food that those coppers were feeding on and their nest sites were gone and predicted that they'd be all be gone by in two more years time. So um, they've had a big planting, they had an action group, they had some crowdfunding and they did a whole lot of planting of native species to replace those exotic pine um, um, plantations. Just showing that these cockatoos have very dependent on particular areas and if they lose their feed and their habitat, they lost the birds. So conservation is very important. So. Um, so, okay, on to the glossy black cockatoo. See if his, I'll let his calls go glossy to, I won't cut it off this time. <laughs> They're quite different from the yellow tails. I'll try and talk over it. So it's the smallest of the five black cockatoos. And even though it says it's glossy, it's, it's, uh, I'm going to have to move it on and then see if I can, can go back. I'll come back and talk about the what it looks like later. So some of the early artists in Australia actually, um, some very early paintings of the glossy. George Raper, 
came out on the Sirius in the first fleet, and this was a, his version of a female um, cockatoo he painted then. And Sarah Stone painted this slightly strange tailed version in um, drawn from skins. Is that? Can no. you hear it now? No. No. Oh, it's the bloody sound that's done it. Yeah. Okay. So stop sharing. Stop share again. I apologise. No matter what you do, something happens. <laughs> okay. Give up on the sounds. It's now it's not progressing. <laughs> now what's happening? Stop share again. Okay, stop share again. Listen. I apologise, we're still fiddling. If I go back to go back to to that one. Yep. Go back. Yeah, okay. That's what we did. Okay. What's happening? I do apologise. We're fiddling here with my technical consultant. We've got, to, we've got to come from here, right? Well, let's see what's on my laptop. Okay. Can you see Sarah Stone? Can you hear me? Yes? Yes, yes, we can see Sarah Stone. Um, Sarah. She painted that one from skins that she <laughs> that we collected. The skins, of course, is the, the stuff the bird without being made in a realistic stuffing. So she actually painted that from there. I do apologise, everybody. It's right now? Okay. Yes. William Cooper. So that just shows you some illustrations from another book. Um, you know, just showing the, the male and the female. Um, I'll, um, I think I've got, pardon me, yep. So William Cooper's books have these beautiful illustrations of the male with a not so glossy head, even though it's called glossy and the female. I do apologise everybody, technology no matter what you do. I had to, fortunately I've got a technical assistant here because at home my broadband width was just kept cutting out and it was just too low, so it's slightly better reception and so on here. So here we've got a beautiful picture of a pair of um, glossy black cockatoos. So it's the smallest of the black cockatoo species. Um, the male's got this brown black head. Can you hear me? Yep. And, and brownish on the neck and the underparts, with red or an orange in his tail panels, and otherwise quite a dull black body. The females have got these yellow patches here on the head and the neck, and the tail panels tend to be more orangey red, and they become less barred and more red as they mature, as they get older. A few of the males will have a few patchy yellow feathers here, but mainly um, they've got the, just the plain glossy heads. The young birds, a bit like the adult males, but they've got more spotting of yellow on them still. They're always associated with the casuarinas, the other casuarinas, the she oaks. Um, so the black, the glossy blacks, much less conspicuous crest too, see? quite insignificant, rather than this very sticking up like in the glossy black cockatoo. So they're smaller, much softer calls, and associated around casuarinas. So that's going to distinguish the glossies for you. So these illustrations are from HANSAB, which is a handbook of Australian, New Zealand um, and Antarctic birds. So you've got the male here, and the, the glossy head it doesn't look quite that brown in the real, in the flesh, in the feathers, but it's that brownish head and the red red tail panels. 
is your female, so a mature female with the red tail panels, and these yellow splotches, very depressed, quite insignificant. And a young bird can still have these yellowy patches and a bit more, bit more barring on his tail. In flight, you can see the um, red male with the red tail panels and the females like so. Um, rather charming name they give the female glossies in the, um, the Great Western Wildlife Corridor Project, which I'll tell you a little bit about. They call the girls flossies, which I think is rather nice. And all of the girls have the yellow patching on their heads can be um, quite variable. So if people doing surveys or if you get birds coming to your garden frequently, if you take photos of the girls with the, the yellow patches on their heads, you can actually tell them apart by that, um, the, the colours of their heads. So that's a good way of identifying them, um, if you're so lucky and get them there. Um, so that another fact though, they've got those different facial patterns. They give you good an ID, good ID. Um, this is a poster um, with, good, some, with some identification. See if you can spot the spelling mistake when you're having a look. It's not my spelling mistake. Being a teacher from way back, I'm a bit pedantic about things like this. So here you've got the male. Again, small cockatoo, dark brown, that dull black, dull black or dark or brownish plumage. They're quiet and usually found in small groups rather than big flocks like the yellow tails. The juveniles have got this sun. Um, this thick black banding on their tail feathers and it gradually becomes solid, solid red as they mature. Whereas the females will have some orange in their tails, again changing to red. So here's a mature male with his red tail and the girls, the flossies, with these yellow um, patches on their heads. Whereas these are the yellow tail blacks, yellow tail blacks in flight, so they only got yellow in their tails, they've just got this single these cheek patches and noisy and in much bigger bigger mobs so that's a good way of telling them apart. Um, the other way you can you can tell the glossies from their calls is when they're crunching on the casuarina cones as you said earlier and that crunching noise you'll often just think what on earth's that and then you'll see a couple of glossies sitting in their teeth munching away. There's some lovely pictures from friends of mine like Chris and here's an, the, the glossies really only come to ground to drink and they're mostly um, roosting in tall leafy trees. So the, the casuarinas if they're feeding or just in other leafy trees if they're roosting. Have a look at his bill. I've got some more nice pictures of the bill really adapted for the special food that our casuarinas have fed. Um, Another interesting fact, if it's hot, they perch with one wing away from the body, cool themselves like cooling their armpits, and they pant with their bill slightly open. They often hang upside down and they can be approached quite closely when they're just quietly sitting there feeding. Here's a male yellow spots, it's a young bird because he's still got the banding on the tail. Big bulbous bill and quite insignificant crest. Here's a beautiful picture showing you. Now it's holding, well you can't really tell from this picture, but it'd be holding the seed in its left foot. So it's eating on a, a casuarina. Very much um, active soon after sunrise. Forgive me if I say casuarina, I'm afraid that's stuck in my mind. They're very active soon after sunrise. They preen, you know, get their feathers in order, calling and flying about. Then they disperse in small groups to forage. So they can be roosting at night in bigger groups. In the middle of the day, they're quiet, they sleep, they preen. And they'll be actively foraging again in the afternoon. And they've got quite habitual places where they come down to drink. And then they'll move to their roosting spots at night sharp, sharp bill crunching into that um, she ate cone there. So another thing they commonly do is another interesting fact, they do foliage bathing. So when the, they land on top of wet leaves, 
with their wings spread out and they flap their wings and they get their um, they perch there and get they uh, bathe in those wet leaves to cool down. Um, with this bird again holding, it's a female, holding the cashewine cone in her left foot. They did a study in Eden and they said they worked out that the birds spend about 80% of their, 88% of their time feeding. So just quietly feeding on those cones. And a bit less on Kangaroo Island. Their sleeping posture, they'll stand on both legs, they turn their head back over their left wing and they rest their head between their wings. They'll have their eyes closed and their crest just slightly raised and that's very much the typical sleeping pose. Here's another one, left footed again, and very much dependent on those alocasia emas. Um, this is at my place. Um, I've got a little stand of the, these um, forest she oaks around my place. And down on the ground, I'll often pick up, I'm not sure if you can see, this is about the size of the cones here. Now they always prefer the cones that have been produced last year, so 12 months before. That's got most nutritious seeds. But down on the ground, I'm not sure if I can show these, but the ones they've been feeding on. So crunched, you can see that they've taken the seeds out. They're quite fibrous now. So that's a lot of those seeds are down on the ground and it's at my place. I unfortunately haven't seen any for a while, but um, they certainly have been there. And if I'm lucky enough, more might come back. Um, this is the other bit, one of their other very common foods, um, the Alicagerina literalis. Um, that's the black she oak, yes, that's its common name. And as I said, they, produce, they prefer cones produced in the previous year, which have a higher nutrient content. And some person doing a study found out that a non-breeding bird has been shown to get through up to 580 cones a day, which is pretty incredible. This shows you the um, down on the ground where they've been feeding, um, chewing on those um, cones and dropping them on the ground and that noise is quite distinctive. You'll hear the clicking of their beak and the noise of the falling cones. So they use their very strongly modified beak um, to open those cones. Ah, now why have I got this picture here? Actually I looked at this myself and I thought why have I put this picture here because it's not in fact um, a glossy eggs because they would really only lay one. But the reason I put this in because this is, um, Sue mentioned the sea eagles that we watch at Sydney Olympic Park. This is actually, well, just the other day, um, this is, they've got two eggs in the nest now. And this year they've been bringing in, they line their nest with um, fresh green leaves. And they've actually been bringing in some casuarina leaves. This is the, the swamp she oak, um, Ala casuarina blocker that's growing around the edge of the forest there. So just thought that was rather strange because we haven't noticed that any other years in the, in the sea eagle's nest. This brilliant picture just shows you how its, its bill is adapted. It's, you can see this curve here. So you'll pick a, le uh, pick a cone, hold it in his foot, and then part of it fits in here in this curve. And the very sharp point here can pick out the teeny little seeds in the casuarina cones. So just spends an awful lot of the time chewing away and manipulating these seeds and you hear this click, click, click noise. Um, they feed their young by regurgitating seeds. So the female will come onto the breeding a little bit, but the male actually feeds the female and then she'll regurgitate food to feed her young. Their bill is quite different from other parrot bills. And they've got that narrow tip and the, which lies along the, the front of the lower bill. You've got that V shape or that concave curve. And it's very, it works in fact like pinches and the lower bill can be deflected sideways. Why a species is this particularly adapted? It's just incredible. There's another nice picture. Um, someone on the central coast has sent 
um, took some pictures recently. And here's another one. Again, holding the cone in their left foot and manipulating the seeds. I have been shown occasionally to eat a few other things, but really absolutely dependent on our lacasurinas. Where's my breeding picture? I was going to, I've lost my picture about the breeding, I'll just tell you about them. They're very much dependent on tree hollows for nesting and quite large tree hollows in a hollow stump or a limb. It can be a living or a dead tree or even a hole in just a trunk or a tall tree. Um, they breed from March through to August or September. And the eggs are laid in the hollow on wood splinters or just bark that's in there. Nearly always one, which, you know, you've only got one young, all your eggs in one basket, as the saying goes. Rarely two, and they have a dull white egg. Only the female incubates and broods the young and feeds the young initially. They're in the nest, uh, the incubation period is about, about 30 days. While she's incubating, while she's in the nest hollow, the male will feed her. But she calls in the evening, he'll, she'll come out and he'll feed her. And then as the chick grows, she'll spend less and less time in the tree hollow and she'll only brood at night. And once the young is feathered, so we can firmer regulate, she'll feed the young herself in the, in the morning, in the late afternoon. And it fledges at about three months, so fledging takes its first flight. But then they'll hang around with the parents and be fed by the parents for another three or four months. And they can even stay with the parents until the next breeding season. So very quite restricted um, breeding time and with only one egg, very susceptible to things going wrong. Um, been a lot in the news recently about the glossy, uh, the kangaroo island gloss, glossy black cockatoos. And a lot of the studies that have been done on glossies we've learned from the Kangaroo Island birds and studying there. So it's a subspecies um, um, endangered. There used to be thousands um, numbered in the glossy black cockatoos occurring from Western Victoria to the Mount Lofty Ranges. But the population on, on Kangaroo Island crashed to best about 155, 150 individuals in 1995. Then they had a lot of study there and um, a lot of the low breeding success they worked out was predation, predation of eggs and young by brush tail possums. So not only do they eat the eggs, they actually eat the young in the nest. The main cause of decline it was in these years. So they, they on Kangaroo Island, they nest in large hollows in eucalypts, primarily sugar gums, eucalyptus plater calyx, and usually near their food, food trees, within about one and a half kilometres of water. And they'll fly about 12 k's to their primary feeding areas. One egg between January and late July. And the, the earlier um, eggs laid are more likely to, to, to do better. 30 days incubation, 90 days in the nest, very slow, um, um, growth from the young birds compared with other cockatoo species. And among the nestlings, there's an equal ratio of males and females, but um, after their fledge, there's, there's always about two males to each female on Kangaroo Island. For some reason, there's a greater mortality of females after fledging, and I don't think they quite sure why. And then of course, came the fires. Um, everybody's heard in the news about the fires, um, extensive fires on, on Kangaroo Island. Um, the Department of Environment and Water estimated that about 75% of South Australia's glossy black cockatoo um, population on Kangaroo Island was burned in, um, was, was affected um, very much in those fires. And a huge area of the island was burned in those fires. Mm -hmm. There's other unique species that were affected there, like the Kangaroo Island, Island Dunnet. Both seen extensive areas of their critical habitat burned. 
Um, so in spite of all the conservation work, um, protecting the trees, protecting growing new trees, protecting them from possums, a lot of the study, they've lost a lot of their key breeding and feeding areas on the north coast of Kangaroo Island. So really, really extensive. Um, the burned areas um, had about 59% of all the known glossy black cockatoo feeding habitat and um, affecting about 75% of the population and uh, um, contained nearly three quarters of all the known nests there and a lot of the artificial nest boxes were also destroyed. But good news rather recently, they've been finding some glossy black cockatoo chicks on the island at the moment. So in spite of all that um, fire, not long after the smoke had cleared, they found some surviving cockies in the burnt areas and some even in the artificial nesting boxes. So there have been some, there has been some recovery and there are at least 23 glossy black, black cockatoos um, in the nest on Kangaroo Island. I got this picture from the, um, from the ABC. I'm really, it shows you a chick obviously, but I really can't understand why there's all those eggs there because they only lay one egg. So I tried to get another picture and then I, I, I just can't understand that. So they're, they're nesting there and surviving and they're really keeping an eye on the nest to ensure that they've got enough food to keep the nestlings going until fledging. So even after those terrible, terrible fires, some of the glossies are um, surviving. In other, they've been planting some of the, the alocasurinas that they, um, that they feed on on Kangaroo Island and also artificial nest boxes like that one there. Um, one seems to be chained to the tree um, and they can monitor the nest boxes and keep a study. So it's one of the few places where they've done extensive studies. So as I said, a lot of the problems there have been with brush tail possums. And one way of protecting them is to, is to put pieces of tin around the bottom of the, the trees like that so the possums can't climb up. Um, without, with, with protection, the probability of an egg resulting from a, from a fledgling increases from about 23% to 42%. So it's not just competition from the, um, um, the possums eating them. There's also extensive competition from little corellas and galahs competing for nest places. So that's a significant effect, um, a significant effect as well. So the, that glossy, the population there, which is a threatened species, is, is hopefully um, recovering and allow its return to mainland South, South Australia as well. Um, so there's a picture of, of one at the nest hollow. So again, only one egg, um, long incubation time, just the female um, broods and protects the birds. So she's dependent on her male coming back and feeding her when she's, um, when she's incubating. And um, she's in the nest hole, she's very, very susceptible to goannas or other species coming and um, threatening her the nest hollow. Um, not exactly beautiful babies, but just shows you. Um, so here's a little one with just starting to get their, their feathers. You can see the, um, the bark and the wood chips in the bottom of the hole, remains of one egg. So this, this bird still wouldn't be able to thermoregulate, so it would need brooding from its parent, but, it's, but it is improving. Um, how am I going time-wise because I'm nearly... Um, yeah, 10 yeah. minutes short of the hour. Ex oh, goodness. Okay, excellent. Well, with much stuffing around with technology. <laughs> um, you'll get some wonderful information um, about the, the glossy black cockatoos from the Glossies in the Mist project which is with um, um, National Parks and in the, in the project, the, the Great Western Wildlife Corridor Project. There's great information. Um, and, then, and they're doing a lot of work in maintaining critical landscape connectivity and planting the casuarinas. And local landholders are receiving geo tube stock that they, and incentives for revegetation to, um, to extend and retain existing um, stands of she oaks and hollow bearing trees. So not removing those trees, not removing that critical habitat.
with some great information about the glosses there. So the glosses in the mist, and they have the great Western Wildlife Corridor cockatoo count. I've not been involved, but they're things that people can get involved in. And then there's the, um, the Glossy Black Conservancy, which is, they have fantastic information um, you can get on their website. If you just Google Glossy Black Cockatoos, you'll find a lot of this information. Um, this is from South East Queensland and far northern New South Wales. Um, it's been going since 2005. It's, it's a collabora collaboration, I mean, now between universities and local councils and a whole lot of group working together and very much um, studying the cockatoos. There's heaps of information um, on their fact sheets about the casuarina, the other casuarinas that can be grown, but identifying the birds, um, really good fact sheets and information and learning kits. Great, great information there. And um, I found this lovely poem that some children had written. There was a, the Gundungurra um, down in the south coast, um, around the Windsor Caribbee Shire Council, and with, with National Parks, had this Glossies in the Mist um, um, project. And they worked with some of the local school children and talking about the birds on country and encouraging the children. And they did some poetry in first languages and talking about and educating the children as to how they can learn about the Glossies, identify them. Uh, they don't know how many are breeding there. They don't know where they are. are they, what, are their, what are their predators there? Are they vulnerable to pests? And can the current landscape there sustain their unique feeding behaviour? So this little kid who's in year four has written this delightful poem about the glossy black cockatoo. He's standing under the Daradan, which is the Alocasurina. He sees a black and red garrel eating dewy nuts. The cockatoo tells me that they need help. I know I need to help and plant I think that's how you say it. And just to finish then, um, Judith Wright's poem about the black cockatoos. The black cockatoos are supposed to be often considered as um, messengers um, calling for or bringing rain. Now there's some argument whether they all do or do not call, but it's a nice story. I've got the, I'm not sure if you were aware of Paul Kelly's CD, 13 Ways to Look at Birds, but one of the poems in there with the music is reading Judith Wright's story, poem about the black cockatoos. In heavy flight they came till I could hear the wild black cockatoos tossed on the crest of their high trees, crying the world's unrest. So I hope you've learned a little bit about glossy black cockatoos. Um, thank you for your time. Um, Happy to ask some questions. Hopefully, I can answer some questions.